Okay, so now I'm happy with all these parts. We're going to assemble the connecting rods onto the crankshaft and then we'll put the whole assembly into the crankcase. Okay, connecting rods. You can see this forked rod here is made of three units because the blade rod runs on this journal which is machined onto this bearing block so it's just a practicality that you wouldn't really be able to machine round here with that arch in the way so you can remove the con rod at the top there and the bearing block is a separate entity so all three pieces are pulled together by the four bolts on here and they've got correlation marks on them this is number six um, and also the bolts themselves are all numbered in sequence so in theory if you take the whole thing apart and throw it on the floor you'll be able to put it all back together um, this particular one one of the 24 bolts actually had a different number so when it's been overhauled like I thought it had they've obviously changed that one probably because it's been reused too many times so what we're going to do is remove that cap make sure I keep it all the right way around goes that way it goes a particular way around on the crank as well I've oiled the bearings so we're going to fit that onto there put the nuts on it And the idea with these <coughs> is that the bolts have to reach their yield points. So it's what you call stretch bolts on a modern engine. Um, no different, it's exactly what they used to do 80 years ago. And so we don't do them up to a specific torque, we do them up until the torque doesn't increase anymore. And when that happens, you know that the bolt is starting to stretch. So what we do first is we're going to nip them up. I've also oiled the threads of the bolts. Doing this in totally the wrong sequence. Let's get it right. We're supposed to go diagonally with these, right? So let's have a look at that. Okay. So we nip them up a bit at a time in a diagonal sequence. Sure the heads of the bolts are tapped fully home because that one isn't I can see okay right pull them up again see loose and I'm just pulling them up to a nominal torque and in actual fact the fact that I'm holding that spanner like that gives me a nominal torque which is going to be a lot lower than the stretch we're going to put on them so what they say is the bolts have to stretch somewhere between 25 and 30 there goes the socket 25 and 35 pounds feet of torque on this rod um, so we're using a torque meter to do it i'll start off on that top one there and you'll be able to see um, hopefully that as I keep pulling the torque wrench around, it's going to reach a point where the needle doesn't move any further. And that's supposed to be within the range of 25 to 35. So let's see what happens. I'm just going to pull them up to 20 initially. And the reason for that is just so that we're not putting way more force on one of the bolts and the other three. <clears throat> so let's see what this one reads. That's about it there. Okay, 25. So now the other one. You see that? Let's have a look. Right. <laughs> I'm struggling to see it from here. Right. Bit over, a bit more than 25. slightly under a 
And again, that one's 24, 25. So what we do is, the split pin's going in here. Um, somewhere I've got a special tool, which is no good if you can't find the special tool. Well, what's that thing they say about proper preparation and all that? Right, um, the special tool, which just helps me to line the castellations up with the hole in the bolt. So we can now wind this, each of these bolts on as much as another castellation or one sixth of a turn, and it'll just continue to stretch the bolt. And the typical stretch we're putting in these bolts is somewhere um, anything up to eight thousandths of an inch. We can actually see and I'm just past the point of the split pin hole. Um, so if I bring, we'll start with this one, if I bring this one round. There. Okay, so we can see the tool now goes in there. Now, if you look at the angle, now that's out there. When these bolts were made originally, the split pin hole was here. So every time you stretch the bolts, because these have been reused, um, which you don't normally tend to do on a modern engine, it comes around slightly at an angle, so you end up around there. And that does cause an interference issue with the blade rod, as you'll see later, which we can get around. Um, the maximum angle they give you is 22.5 degrees. Although actually in 1946 they introduced a note increasing the twist on these bolts to 45 degrees for the same bolt. Um, and the bolts that are on the blade rod maintain 22.5 degrees. Um, once they twist more than that it means they've got too much stretch in them and, and then you have to fit new ones. So um, if I was building this for my flying aircraft let's say I don't know whether I'd want to put new bolts in every time, or whether I'd want to keep using these which have worked before, as long as they were stayed within the limits, because they are extremely good bolts. And I'd be thinking, well, if I put a new bolt in, uh, what if that fails? <laughs> you know. But they are NDT tested, so um, so we're going to go around do all four of these. Let's have a look where this is. Oh, it's okay. There we go. That's only got to go a tiny bit. There we go. Ooh, almost. And the reason I'm using this tool <coughs> is because when they first designed this engine and first built it, they just used a conventional split pin in these bolts. And what they were finding was that the, the split pins or cotter pins used to vibrate and they'd fail in fatigue and fall out of the conrod. That doesn't necessarily mean that the nut would come undone because in actual fact stretch tightening these you know is putting a lot of closure on there and it's almost a little bit in a way equivalent to having a spring washer underneath there. It's not the same but um, anybody that works on modern engines will testify that they don't use split pins in a lot of these components. The, um, the nuts typically on the big ends of a modern engine don't have split pins in them and they don't have any other kind of locking device on a lot of them. Um, oh, this one's playing up isn't it? Right, what's going on there? <laughs> I can't see properly, it's got it. Okay, I think the split pin might go in that one. I'll go across to the top. And so, can't see that one at all. So what they did was um, they started to introduce ground split pins which you'll see when I fit them 
and basically they're just a very close tolerance there we go and you can see the twist on that one they're all about the same um, they're a very close tolerance fit through here so they don't vibrate they don't fatigue and they don't fall out um, following on from that they used to have issues with when you fold the split pin over here or there um, you have to be you do have to be a little bit careful not to really ram it down against that sharp corner there uh, or up over the top of here because that can cause them to fail as well before I put the split pins in I'm going to check this bearing block which is effectively these two components here for out of round or ovality basically you do it by going about a quarter of an inch from the joint in either direction and then we um, we do a couple of other checks on it as well so three five three Three, good. And then the you actually feel the joint to make sure there's nothing untoward there, any kind of step, and it's nice and smooth. You really can't feel it if they're if they're working the way they should do. <clears throat> um, big end journal on here. I measured that. I measured them all. Um, the crank is standard, and actually, it's not really showing anywhere. It's got a nice finish on the journals, um, and it's right up within. A tenth of a thou certainly of what it was so that's one ten thousandth of an inch I think is that right of what it was when it was made so the split pins to be honest they just look like every other regular split pin they've got corrosion inhibitor on them they're stainless steel in actual fact um, but they were ground and they're ground because you, you can't hold the ends of these things anybody that does machining they're actually ground between a set of grinding stones a bit like that sort of idea it rotates and then passes out to the end of the grinding wheels they're quite a close fit in there so there's one of the pins fitted just so I do it, just pull them around like that, coming out, get back in, right. Pull it up like that, push that one down, just give that a tap. Same with the others. That's it. And now this is ready to have the blade rod fitted. Right, so this is the the plane or blade rod that goes in between here. Something I meant to mention before, the shells. These are just removable shells. They've got a tang there on one side of each of them. Um, they're quite thin. This is the thinnest shell on the engine. But if we have a look at one of the main bearing shells before we put the crank in, you'll see they're quite a thick back on them but this is very close to what's in a modern car engine um, which is what they call a van der Waal bearing where the the backing which is made of steel is pressed out and the bearing material is plated onto it as you can see these are bronze bearing material uh, rather than the white metal Packard used more white metal and silver than Rolls-Royce did on their um, bearing shells so Again, everything's marked with correlation marks, but actually also, because they are quite hard to read, the two tangs go on the same side of the rod, anyway, and I can see the number six in the two positions on here. 
marks all over them, there's numbers written all over these things because they're an aircraft part. Um, we're going to oil these first. So. Okay, now, what I was referring to earlier about the twist on these, sometimes that split pin there, for example, will actually catch on the side of here and it will prevent that going in. But it is just about touching it there. So you can damage the bearing fitting them. So I've lost the positions of these now. Okay. Nope. So what you have to do with them is kind of jiggle them in that way. What we'll do is we'll feed that one in. If you feed it in right around the back of there, you can actually get it in with the bolts fitted to it. And then similarly, we then once that's in position, we then bring it around there. Put the cap on. Just bring the rod around far enough to get the cap partially on. And then we fit it like that. And now it's it's far enough in that we don't have a problem. Then we'll oil these nuts. Threads, I should say. And then we're going to nip these up just like we did before, make sure the bolts are fully home. And as you probably guessed, because there are only two of these and they're a bigger bolt, we're going to go for a tighter torque range, but we're still going to stretch them. So again, just do them up progressively. freedom of movement. That was another check by the way on the forked rod we need to check for freedom of movement all the way around make sure there are no tight spots. They do have very slight variations on these particularly this rod running on here sometimes they go slightly tighter and slightly freer but actually this one's lovely no problem with that. Now I've forgotten the torque numbers <coughs> Okay, so we're looking for 55 to 75 pounds feet. I'm going to pull these up a bit more. That's the range within which we want them to ideally stretch. There. Right, put the torque meter back on it. That is. It's about 70, isn't it? That? Right. God, my glasses are falling off. I can't see that. Okay, 65-ish, something like that. Right, and then we do the same thing again. We move them on. In actual fact, that one's pretty close. Basically what you can't do is back them off to get these uh, split pins to line up but you can go as I said another whole one sixth of a turn if you want without doing any harm to the bolt. There we go. If the bolts aren't stretched what tends to happen is you haven't got the maximum clamping force and you get a very very small amount of movement in the bolt as the engine is running because this is a rotating assembly. The bolt will basically be like hammering backwards and forwards in there it'll fret against the joint there and the joint where the head of the bolt is inside here and it'll become looser and looser and it's basically like a slide hammer banging backwards and forwards and the bolt will fail 
and then all hell breaks loose because I've had that happen on my engine. So then look. There we go. So I'll put the split pins in here. Let's get that out of the way. Okay. I'll put the split pins in. Do all the rest of them. So we've got all 12 done up. And then we can look at the main bearings in the crankcase and we can lower this assembly in. Well, I've just watched that last bit of video back. And I can see that actually the fork rod bolts are pulling up at 29 and 30 pounds feet, that sort of range, not the 24, 25 that I was saying. And that's bang on because it's right bang in the middle of the 25 to 35 range. So it shows you how good those bolts are. So we're ready to put the completed assembly into the crankcase now. Um, you can see I've just got the crankcase sitting on the floor. These are actually rubber conveyor belts to protect the studs. When I used to have a business building these things every day, we had turnover stands, we had test stands for testing them inside, outside in the yard with propellers on them. We had um, a water brake dynamometer and so on and so forth. Um, because I'm just doing this for fun, I don't have that massive industrial premises anymore. So in actual fact, I don't have the space for big turnover stands because they are about seven, at least seven foot long. So this is how I do it. And when I rebuilt my own running engine last winter, did it in here exactly the same. I completely stripped the whole engine down and back again. So we can put the crankshaft assembly in. We lower that down. We've got the overhead crane in here. I can then put the lower crankcase or the sump on top of it. I then turn it back over and it goes on the trolley and we can start building the engine up and from the front and back end on the trolley. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please feel free to subscribe to the channel uh, if you haven't already. Have a look at some of the other videos on here of engines being built and tested and so on. And come back next time when we drop the crankshaft into the crankcase and see if it all turns properly.